This is a production of Cornell University. So I've been the leader of NUA for about 10 years. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. It's been exciting. So what is NUA? It's a knowledge network, essentially. Farmers share data through the network, providing us with feedback and guidance of how to use that data and better present it on the web to them. The weather data is collected every 15 minutes and tabulated in hourly and daily summary tables. We're collecting precipitation, temperature, dew point temperature, humidity, leaf wetness, solar radiation, wind speed, and wind direction. And now uh, the company that provides the weather instruments, Rainwise Incorporated, has allowed people to add two optional sensors. And the most uh, popular, shall we say, are soil temperature and soil moisture. We designate sister stations within the network to plug in data where we have missing data. So that, for instance, if we're accumulating degree days, we don't have an oops, you know, a week or so of missing data, and the degree day value would be erroneous. And we extrapolate one hour gaps in our data. Essentially, what we're doing is we're, we're creating with that data decision support tools for IPM and crop production. So a little bit about NUA's history. It was created in 1996 by Kurt Petzold, who was the vegetable IPM coordinator in the New York State IPM program. It started out as an association with membership levels, different pay membership levels. Today, it's free access with land grant and grower support to provide some funding. We initially were using Sensor and Campbell instruments Sensor was bought by a company called Sensatronics. Those stations became obsolete. And today we've got Rainwise Incorporated weather instruments, onset instruments. We serve up airport location data as well as state climatology mesonets through our network. Initially, we were going out and manually downloading the data from computers, putting that data into a fax and faxing that information out to growers, or we were recording messages on what was called a CODA phone, for those of you who might remember those days. Uh, and then growers could dial that number and find out what the report du jour was. But uh, then we went to modems, and we were collecting data every day and serving it up on a website. Today, we've got a few instruments that are still connected in through file transfer protocol, or FTP. Um, we're trying to phase that out. Rainwise wrote that software for us. Ma the majority are connected in through the internet, through an e internet interface that comes with the weather instrument. And uh, Rainwise just launched, launched a cellular data plan and has a cellular modem instrument as well. We now have, as of yesterday or the day before, 375 active weather stations in the network. I think a total is probably pushing closer to 400, but they come and go as they're taken out for maintenance or what have you, as, as you can imagine. These are instruments on the ground collecting data. And we're, we've got a footprint in 20 states, primarily in the east, northeast, and into the Midwest. We have 10 member states plus some individual members. Growers in non-member states can now join. So NUA is open access, providing data in real time, query-based decision support models with built-in biofix or the ability of growers to enter their own biofix information for, for the models. The models are interactive with a, a user interface. This is just to give you a snapshot of the homepage, nua.cornell.edu. I don't really, you know, this is kind of like the sequencing slide. You don't have to read this. It's OK. So uh, basically, the key is that there's a blue menu that follows you throughout the website. And you can access weather data, pest forecasts, station pages, crop management models, and some crop pages that we have to serve up IPM information and other information of use to the grower as well as some information <clears throat> about weather stations. So if a grower wanted to buy a weather instrument, they could, and they would be able to learn how to do that. Um, the blue menu on the website provides the interactive tools. 
And a, a neat thing that I've used quite a bit is up here in the corner is a National Weather Service little query box. Um, so you can put in your city and state, hit go, and you'll go to the National Weather Service site and you'll be able to find out what the forecast is for your location. As of now, as many of you know, the internet knows where you are at all times, okay? So Big Brother is watching and this map will save to your location and center the next time you come in on where you're located. So, um, you know, for a lot of you millennials and stuff, that's really cool, you're excited about that. For people like me, it's like, ah, somebody knows where I am, I don't know if I can handle it. So, but anyway, it's kind of cool because then, you know, it basically centers the map for you and you don't have to move it and, and whatnot. There are station pages for every weather station in the network, and these provide quick links to tools. They are built on default biofix dates based on historic records that faculty have for apple insects, grape phenology stages, things like that, or typical planting dates for onions or potatoes, etc. So um, although these aren't interactive, you can still get to the interactive results, but these are quick links for degree days, daily and hourly summaries, and then pest forecast quick links. Gives you a lat lawn elevation, tells you the station sensors, the last good download date uh, that occurred at that station location. So this gives you a snapshot of NUA's current map. Um, I grabbed this snippet off the website, I think, again, day before yesterday or yesterday. And this is zoomed in here on New York. Um, this is the entire map here, and it shows that we're now reaching into Minnesota. We've got individuals in the Plains, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois. And then most recently, Virginia became a member, and North Carolina. So uh, we're moving to the south, which kind of makes for a little nail biting of, you know, are the models really useful down there? So we do a lot of discussion with the faculty that are requesting expansion of NUA to make sure that it's going to be applicable. So why am I here? Well, number one, I contacted Jeff and I said, hey Jeff, can I give a seminar on NUA? Everybody's been telling me I gotta get the word out. You know, I gotta tell Cornell University about this. So I said, okay, Let's do this, and he said, all right. So how might NUA benefit programs in soil and crop sciences? Well, NUA basically now is operating the weather stations on your research farms. The Aurora Station, the Willsboro Station, and the station at Shazee Minor are the stations that are on your research farms. Musgrave Research Farm, Willsboro Research Farm, and WH Minor Institute. So um, I've worked with the Cornell um, facilities, the Cornell, oh my gosh, Ag Experiment Station, yes, Julie. I'm at the New York State Ag Experiment Station. You guys are the Cornell University Ag Experiment Station. So I've been working with the facilities director to get these weather stations plugged in on the various research farms that Cornell operates. Right now, we really don't have very many tools for agronomic crops. We do have an alfalfa weevil tool that is built on a degree day model that Ray Carruthers developed uh, back in the day. And then obviously we've got a number of degree days that I think might be of use to uh, agronomic crops. So the two main reasons that I'm here, one is to stimulate your thinking about developing and utilizing NUA to benefit agriculture. How might that happen? What is your vision? Contact us, let us know. And also to raise awareness of what NUA has to offer. So to that end, I'm going to give you a little sampling of the predictive models, or what is increasingly, these are being called tools now. I always used to call them models. So if I say models or tools, you'll know that it's a transitioning terminology, and I basically mean the same thing. So we've got phenology models for plant diseases and insects, crop management tools, and weather products. Again, they're real-time, query-based, decision support with built-in biofix or an interactive user interface where they can enter the biofix. This is the pest forecast menu right here off of the web. And basically we've got 14 plant disease tools, 11 insect phenology tools. 
These are now increasingly, most of them are providing a five-day forecast look into the future so that a grower can prepare if they know they're going to be at risk for a certain disease or insect developmental stage. They can get their spray set up and go out and apply that spray in a timely fashion. They can assess that risk, learn IPM info, and get decision support through these tools. And again, they're interactive. So this just gives you a, a snippet of the grape forecast models that are available in NUA. Most of the models that are served up on the website have a little utility here on the left-hand side of the page where you would select a disease or insect for grapes. Everything is on one page. So you would select, we have grape berry moth, grape diseases, or DMCAST, which is a simulation model for grapevine downy mildew, available from this page. We are building now, because we're in so many states, we'll have a state, select the state, and then the weather station location is selected. We default to the current date, but you can go back in time. So you can select a historic date as well. Obviously, I needed to do that to create this snippet by going back to last spring. When you first go onto the page, the map tab is active. So if you don't know the weather station location, you'll, when you select the state, here will be the image of the map centered. And you can zoom in on that so that you can then decide, well, I think this is really the geographic region I'm interested in. You click on the icon on the map, and the name of the weather station location plugs in there. So after you've decided your ending date, you hit calculate and the results pop up on the results tab. And then there's more info. We might have fact sheets, uh, information on how to use the model more effectively, that type of thing in the more info tab. So here you can see a pretty common format that we use is a table showing the two past days, the current date, and the forecast days. On this one, we actually tabulate three diseases of grapes, Fomopsis, powdery mildew, and black rot. A little bit of information about those models is here, what the models are doing, what they're calculating. The grower can change the phenological stage. We're estimating that 10-inch shoot growth is where we're at on May 29th of last year. This is based on Concord a variety of grapes that is grown for juice. It's probably the largest number of acreage of any variety of grapes grown in New York. But in this region, most growers are growing wine grape varieties. They might be growing Chardonnay, Riesling. <clears throat> and so they can change the phenological stage. The other thing is my colleague in IPM was telling, we were talking about how Spring is kind of, we're all nail biting because spring is here and yet it's not really April. So one of the things that can happen is you can go from three inch shoot growth in grapes to 12 inch shoot growth in grapes in a matter of three days if it's really hot. And so this gives flexibility to the model and changing this may change the disease management messages. So these go, you would scroll down the page and then you would get to the disease management messages for each of the diseases in this model. So that gives you a perspective on how most of the models work. Some of the crop management tools that we have, not that many, we have three primarily focused around apples. They again are assessing risk, providing decision support, and they primarily are focused on crop load management, irrigation, and freeze risk. This is the Cornell Apple Carbohydrate Thinning Model. Again, there's the utility on the left to enter the weather station. It'll have the state selection soon. The current date or the date of interest would be selected. The results tab will show up and the grower would enter their green tip date. In the Hudson Valley, we're already at green tip and apples. Not yet in the Lake Ontario region, thankfully. They would enter their bloom date, and then there's a button here, and they would click Calculate. This table then builds below this utility to provide these data related to the tree carbohydrate status, starting from the green tip date, 
down to the current date that you've selected, which is the green row, light blue rows above, tan rows below are building the forecast down in time. And then below this is the carbohydrate balance of the chart. And the end user can scroll along this and little pop-up boxes will show up saying the date and the carbohydrate balance. So giving basically what is being shown at that point on that graph. The take home message for your purposes is if the tree is in deficit, if it's in carbohydrate balance deficit, it's going to be easier for the grower to thin the apples off the tree. So they have to reduce their thinner rate. If the carbohydrate balance is in the po on the positive side, on the plus side, it's going to be harder to thin the apples off. The tree has a lot of reserved carbohydrate. They're going to hang on to all that fruit. They're going to be able to ripen that fruit. So it's going to be harder to thin. And that's what this model does. It's going to tell them to either increase the chemical thinner rate or decrease the chemical thinner rate. This model is probably the biggest driver in terms of end users putting weather stations on their farm. It is huge in terms of crop quality, crop value. If you thin your crop too much, you don't have a crop. If you under thin, you don't grow premium quality apples that are big and bring a premium price. This is a new utility that was developed by Arte Gaetano at the Northeast Regional Climate Center that is estimating two inch soil temperature across the Northeast. So these tools that are developed by the Climate Center provide outputs like this. They're color coded maps that generate this graphic and you can see here, as of two days ago, the soils were warming in the Hudson Valley, but they were still kind of cold in the Adirondacks, up in Maine, and then to a certain extent along Lake Ontario. What are some of the weather products that you might be interested in? So on the weather product menu, what I've done is I've highlighted this because this is new as of this month. We just rewrote the degree day calculator that Art Agnello and I had created about, I don't know, 12 years ago or so, eight years ago. Um, and when we migrated our database, the programming language wasn't compatible. So we have just kind of resurrected this and we're really excited about it. But basically, under weather data, you can get degree day tables for 11 base temperatures and they accumulate from January 1st, March 1st, April 1st, and May 1st, again, based on end user requests. These base temperatures usually are uh, borrowed from the models that we have, that we've built in NUA. So um, for instance, this 32 is for apple scab ascospore maturity. Um, I think 4C is for cabbage maggot. This bizarre one is for grape berry moth because the research was done in degrees centigrade and the translation ended up being, you know, 47.14 Fahrenheit. Um, we will serve up our hourly data in tables summarized, and these are month by month tables, providing daily summary tables, and then again, the degree day calculator. So I'll spend a little bit more time on this because I think this is an area that is growing, and I've been explaining this to our end users, and they're seeing how important this can be to document issues that have occurred if they've particularly got crop insurance or something like that, and they need these data. They need to be able to document them and print them off or what have you. So it was a mild winter, right? Yeah, it was a mild winter except for um, Valentine's Day. There was a significant freeze event on Valentine's Day. And in Highland, New York, which is in the Hudson Valley, the, the data logger, the weather station recorded this event. So in the hourly data, you can see how the, the tables are presented. And you can see each hour how cold it got. If we look at the daily summary table for this same event, you'll see how the minimum was minus 10.6 degrees Fahrenheit with fairly cold weather each day preceding and after that event. 
But before that, it was actually really mild. Uh, my colleagues in the Hudson Valley have been out cutting buds on peach and sweet cherry, and pretty much the peach crop down there is toast. Most of the flower buds were killed, and the sweet cherries, the jury is still out on that. So this, again, it gives the grower a perspective. They can look back in time and see how cold did it get for how long to know whether their crop, whether particular varieties that they know are hardy or not hardy were damaged. On the other end of the spectrum, when we talk about severe rain events, I was down giving a talk in North Carolina, which again is, is a new partner for NUA. And I said, hey, you know, what was a weird event that, that, that occurred that I could go back and grab the data and, and share with the growers and show them how they can access that? And they said, my gosh, we got like five inches of rain in three days in October, and we were trying to harvest, and it was impossible, and we couldn't get out to harvest. So I went, and sure enough, uh, this weather station that went in last year, Hendersonville, North Carolina, went to the all-weather data utility. This really should say October, but I think I was just too lazy to update it for the purposes of that. But these are the October data. This is the hourly table for that event. And you can see a third of an inch of rain to almost a half of an inch of rain was being logged by the tipping bucket every hour. And then when we look at the daily summary, sure enough, there's that five inches of rain. I'm not sure what might have fallen on the 30th of September, but I didn't want to try to patch that together. Again, these tabulate by month. So uh, yeah, that was significant. They couldn't get out to harvest their fruit. Some of that fruit starts to drop, and there's a lot of crop loss associated with that. So building capacity. What can we do and what have we been doing to try to build capacity? Um, as of 2010, we lost all of our funding support for NUA, and it was coincidental that a lot of my colleagues in New England wanted to join NUA. And so it presented with a challenge and an opportunity at the same time, that we could build this partnership and they could help fund NUA and sustain it into the future. Our partners, including the Northeast Regional Climate Center and Rainwise Incorporated, were also absolutely essential during that downturn. So the Northeast Regional Climate Center partners with us. They house the NUA climate database. They provide model programming into the PI design tools. So the principal investigator decides what they want this tool to be. And they help the programmer decide how to program it with the data that we have. They provide data quality control, meteorological expertise, and guidance. And the nice thing is that they have a high level of interest in agricultural applications of climate data, as many of you know. They have also helped us create automated outage reports that go out to weather station contacts. And I have gotten a lot of emails back. Initially, I thought, oh no, they're going to be mad. We're telling them their weather station is down. But for the most part, they're really excited about getting that report. This is our slide of partners. And you know, it's a good thing. It's starting to get really crowded. So we have two apple grower associations, one in Minnesota, one in North Carolina, that partner with NUA. Penn State, Rutgers, University of Connecticut, University of Massachusetts and University of Vermont are partners. And this year, New Hampshire and Virginia Tech have joined. These partners pay $17.50 per year to be members of NUA. That's our subscription fee. Rainwise Incorporated has been a fantastic partner. They have helped even with software programming, putting leaf wetness sensors onto their stations and developing their stations so that they actually fit the needs of our network. And this is a, uh, just the menu for the about weather stations and a snapshot of the weather instrument. This is a leaf wetness sensor. It currently actually is attached over here to the tipping bucket so that it's facing north at a 45 degree angle, which it has been shown to be the best for the Northeast. So this chart is pretty exciting and also a bit daunting. So um, I became lead in 2005. 
we launched the current website that I've shown you in 2009. And the number of instruments in the, in the system has just grown significantly over these last seven to eight years. We now have 10 statewide members and individual farms, and actually it's only five other states because one of those states is now one of the 10 statewide members. We ingest airport data and we've put into place a humidity and correction factor because obviously the situation in terms of the microclimate near an airport is quite different from an agricultural field. So we have a relative humidity correction factor and we also have a leaf wetness estimate in place for those stations. And we're partnering with uh, the state climatologist in New Jersey for their data. That's this green bar here. So pretty exciting in terms of growth in the number of weather stations over the last seven to eight years. Our farmers and multipliers, again, we have the individual farms in Illinois, Iowa, Maryland, Nebraska, and Wisconsin. Soil and water conservation districts have written grants to fund small mesonets. We have a, a mesonet funded by them in Seneca County in the wine, uh, wine grape growing region. County and regional extension programs have partnered with us. Suffolk County on Long Island, probably most notable, they have about 20 or more weather stations in their network. Again, primarily on vineyards, but also in, on apple farms and in vegetable potato fields down there. We have a couple of arboretums and wilderness areas, obviously the airport locations and state climatology mesonets. So we're essentially crowdsourcing our data and pulling it in. The priorities of our stakeholders we pay pretty close attention to and obviously sustainable funding for most of us, we know how crucial that is. Um, we'd like to rebuild our website. It's going on seven years old now and it would be nice for it to be responsive. So whatever size your screen was or your device was, it would adjust for that. Um, we'd love to have more weather station locations and one way to do that very quickly would be to use the National Digital Forecast Database of gridded data and serve up virtual station locations. Our end users would like apps that reside on their phone that could interface with some of our data, uh, alerts and alarms for frost, uh, heat events, things like that. And they'd also like for us to be able to cache their biofix data. They want more models and tools. Station maintenance and troubleshooting has been a big uh, emphasis of mine in the last year and a half because of a funded project. Um, and then I'm here to promote awareness because so many of them have been saying, Julie, you've got to tell the story. You've, you've got to get out and tell the story about NUA. So in terms of research and development uh, on weather data, we developed the leaf wetness estimator, essentially the simplest and least uh, prone to errors on the negative or positive side, was using an hour with relative humidity above 90%, as well as an, any hour that would be raining, obviously. Um, Art de Gaetano has written and done research on data quality control for precipitation, and when he finds that a tipping bucket has either over recorded or under recorded rain as based on what the gridded data is saying around that instrument, he will send an email out to them saying, hey, you know, we think there's something wrong with your uh, tipping bucket rain gauge. Again, we'd like to build these virtual stations. And if we do, we can compare back and forth between the on the ground data and the virtual data a really nice uh, fertile ground of research would be would be developed and i heard from abby seaman just um yesterday or the day before that she and rj itano are going to be looking at that soil temperature estimate map and comparing that to sensors actually placed in different soil types across new york so they can see whether there's uh, an impact of soil type on that estimate Product development, we've been looking at an eNUA email alert. We beta tested this with apples in 2011 and it's been running for three years now with grape growers. They really like this and we'd like to develop this into a subscription-based product. Essentially for any location they choose, 
They can get the email at a time of their choosing, and it gives them the results of the models, uh, basically in an email format. They don't have to go into the website and click and click uh, to get the information. We've got that degree day calculator that basically you put the start date and the end date, and it'll give you the degree day accumulation for that range of dates uh, for that particular location. We wrote a grant recently to develop a cache for end user inputs. Uh, first trap catch dates, green tip dates, blossom dates, things like that. But unfortunately, eh, it wasn't funded, so that's going to remain on the drawing board. Um, we also had this in a grant, but this also, we did not get that grant. Um, but Art de Gaetano and the Climate Smart Farming Group are moving forward on this. Uh, piece, so that's exciting. And we are still on the drawing board on our responsive web design. We are currently upping the vegetable and apple insect tools, all the vegetable tools, with the five day forecast data. In the apple fire blight tool, we're incorporating an epiphytic infection potential from a third party software called Mary Blight. Art Agnello has written a San Jose scale model for apples that should go into, uh, be implemented this year. I was doing a workshop with apple growers and we were looking at the apple irrigation model and it became clear that we've got some work to do on that model based on some input from that workshop. Um, and we're always open to end user suggestions for improvements and over the last six months We've created a list, a wish list of over 40 different models that are out there in the literature, in the scientific literature that, that we could incorporate into this system. So what's the impact? NUA is transforming weather information and knowledge into tools. Farmers are being able to share resources for weather data collection, analysis, distribution, archiving through integration of all these networks via cloud computing. We're pushing forecasts out five days in advance, so big deal. What's the impact? Before we even launched this website, before we even grew to where we are today, we did a survey in 2007 and we asked growers in New York that were using NUA, and these were apple, grape, onion, and potato growers primarily, whether NUA, using NUA tools reduced sprays, improved spray timing, alerted of pest risk, or enhanced IPM. And all of them, virtually all of them, agreed or strongly agreed. Sometimes, if it's a bad year for diseases, you won't get that reduced spray. Because if it's rainy and wet all season long, you're going to be chasing that disease all season long. These same growers reported on average that they could save $19,500 $15, per year in spray costs, and that was 2007 costs, and save $264,000 per year in crop loss. Again, these are high value horticultural crops. 99% of end users of NUA at that time would recommend NUA use to farmers. And I think that underlines why this has been so popular and why it has grown so much. Uh, in recent years. We now <clears throat> have over 2 million page views per year in NUA. Some anecdotes, I use the NUA site almost every day early in the season. The orchard was largely scab free for the first time in several years. The manager depended heavily on NUA and could see differences between their on-site station and the one they had been using. Two New Jersey growers of apples last year had the best thinning results ever using our tool. So the outcomes are better IPM, reduced pesticide use, improved environmental protection, better crop management, improved crop quality, improved yield, and definitely enhanced decision support. So in the future, we've got some new partners and some new directions to consider. We've just recently embarked on a partnership with EnviroWeather, which is a similar program based at Michigan State University. And I've got a call in to talk this up and see how we can move forward to collaborate. We have models they want, and they have models we want and could really benefit from. 
We've been embarking on conversations with two other state climatology mesonets, North Carolina's Econet and Delaware's DEOS. I probably killed the pronunciation of that, but DEOS. A New York State mesonet is going in. Some of you may be aware of this. 125 weather stations are going in across New York, funded with FEMA dollars in response to Hurricane Sandy, uh, Tropical Storm Irene, and I think uh, Lee. Uh, so we are also discussing with the, the Mesonet on how we can partner in the future. The Climate Smart Farming Group, part of the Cornell Institute for Climate Change and Agriculture, is another area that's ripe for collaboration. And we'll be uh, partnering with them and discussing how to, how to move forward. And we've also been discussing how we can partner with Ag Radar at the University of Maine. Again, our stakeholder objectives, we keep these closely in mind. I've talked about pretty much all of these. Um, we've got a new data product for third-party software uh, called RIMPRO. So we just launched that this month. So that may bring in some revenue for that product. And I would love to create a developer sandbox so that developers could go in on the web and plug in their messages dates when those messages sh should occur, uh, base temperatures, key risk windows, uh, you know, length of wetness, that type of stuff. And that model would just essentially auto-generate. You'd be able to validate it in research mode, make sure it was working, and then potentially implement it. Wouldn't that be nice? So the challenges and opportunities going forward Funding, 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 obviously, is big. We know that Cooperative Extension and land-grant universities are losing funding across the US. And that's why our yearly fees have gone down, down, down. We've tried to keep those as low as we can. State climatology mesonets are in the same boat in terms of funding. And I'm working with them to figure out how, on our website, we can attribute that data to that specific uh, state mesonet and I've got like two or three really good ideas going forward that I think may work We're gonna have to figure out how do we blend with existing systems like MSU's and ViroWeather? What is the geographic reach of our models and and how do we validate that? It would be really great to have a model for leaf wetness leaf wetness sensors stink they're the bane of plant pathologists across the nation we can't stand them we need a really good algorithm for leaf wetness and there are scientists across the u.s and in canada that have been working on this for for some time we'd like to obviously utilize the national digital forecast database and real-time mesoscale analysis data to do a better job with precipitation, humidity, and leaf wetness in those virtual locations. Obviously, data quality control is always a challenge and very important. And we want that website upgrade and responsive web design. The New York State IPM program is looking to staff a NUA coordinator full time if we can get the money to underwrite that position. And we would love to have a programmer also in the New York State IPM program. To, to help us build these various tools. So basically, NUA is access to IPM decision support, providing for the sustainable management of pests using methods that minimize environmental health and economic risks. We use plant disease epidemiology, insect phenology, plant phenology, and crop management to generate these phenology models and forecasts. We've got 40 plus tools on our wish list. We want more station locations, better end user cache and alarms, better quality control and support, and that developer sandbox would be pretty, pretty cool, I think. We are doing a really good job in fruits, particularly tree fruit and grape in New York and across the Northeast. We're doing a pretty good job in vegetables for onions and potatoes. We've got some sweet corn products, a cabbage maggot product. We've just put a grant in to look at uh, insect phenology models and Christmas trees that could spill over and help the nursery trade in New York and across the area that, that NUA reaches into. 
but we could do a lot better job in field crops. And livestock, could we do anything with that? Don Rutz, professor of veterinary entomology when he was director of the IPM program said, absolutely, Julie, of course, and I expect that you're going to do that. So NUA, again, is open access, real-time, query-based decision support with built-in biofixes and an interactive, user-friendly interface. And with that, I'll end, and thank you very much for your attention today, and open it up for any questions you might have. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.